Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to School of Decant, Introduction to Blind Tasting. Um, so cool. Yeah, of course, I'm Cara Patricia of Decant SF, and then with us today is Master Sommelier Vince Morrow. He's been sort of our awesome like guest curator all month. Um, and this is a really cool way. We have got one more event with him next Thursday. And then he like leaves us and goes to Germany for harvest, which is kind of cool. So everybody, this is Vince. Hello. Do we Hi Vince. Do we have everybody? Can we start or are we gonna wait a little bit? I think that this looks like everybody. And if not, I can always bring people in. Everybody just remember if you have any questions or anything like that, you can use the chat function. I'm gonna be keeping an eye on that. Or alternatively, you can also um, unmute yourself. It'll probably be some like, kind of like intense, um, sort of thing. So if you are getting lost at any part at all and need something repeated, please totally let us know. Um, blind tasting is like a really crazy thing. And for myself, I've, I've been training at it for a very long time. Um, Vince has proven his blind tasting prowess. Um, a couple of times. My stubbornness. <laughs> stubbornness. His master only stu stubbornness. Um, so I think we're going to be in really good hands. By the end of this, maybe you, maybe you won't be able to do the get a wine from top to bottom, vintage, uh, you know, variety, region, and everything this time. But you're going to have the tools to start studying uh, yourself if you want. Or just make yourself a little bit um, a little bit more confident when talking and discussing wine or drinking your own wine and trying to figure out what you really like about them. This is really going to kind of help, I think. Um, Vince is kind of going to take it away. I'm going to be following along with the chat so I can answer any questions. Um, you'll see another screen that's going to say my name on it. That'll be like my iPhone or something while I share a little presentation too that uh, he's made for us. So, are we ready? Okay. All right, you go ahead and tell him a little bit. I'll, I'll start sharing the screen. Um, as usual, everybody, I'm sure you're all super familiar with Zoom by now. Um, when I share the screen, you can uh, click like gallery views and, or speaker view and you can do side by side. I think that's in like the view or something options. And, um, yeah. Yeah, just go crazy. Do whatever you want. Easy. Do what you got to do. Yeah. So before we get started, um, there are a couple of optional uh, things you can have in front of you. The only uh, obligatory things in front of you, make sure you have glass, make sure you have the bottles and some wine. Other than that, if you would like, um, you could grab a white background. Um, I use uh, serviettes from the restaurants that I've worked at because they always come home in my pockets. So I always have a lot of these handy, like a white piece of paper, a white paper towel. Um, but certainly if you want to um, learn a bit about the visuals, then you could have a white background. Uh, depending on how your Saturday is going, you could have a spit cup as well. If you don't want to spit out any wine, more power to you. Um, but that uh, I find in terms of uh, judging and assessing wine uh, is a necessity. Whereas um, if we were just um, you know, doing this in our backyard, I probably wouldn't be doing much spitting. Um, but certainly helps in terms of assessing some of the key components uh, in wine uh, as we start to ingest instead of spitting, um, we're actually a um, little bit geeking out, but you're satisfying this um, uh, this natural urge to uh, consume, to, um, to quell your hunger and your thirst. Whereas if you spit something out, 
it really makes you think about what was just in your mouth. Um, and no, no pun intended, it really uh, makes you uh, consider the flavors and the texture that are no longer there. It makes you think about it a little bit more. And uh, you know, if you were judging a wine competition of 50 or 100 wines in a day, you would most definitely want to spit. Um, or if you were you know, driving around Napa Valley and wanted to um, you know, enjoy it, but remember everywhere you've been, it's also a good tool. So a spit cup is optional, depending on how your day is going. And of course, you're more than welcome to uh, take notes, by all means. Um, ask questions, take notes. Um, you can follow up with me via email or Instagram uh, afterwards if we weren't able to get to it. Um, I know Cara um, and Decant, we've kind of, we've blocked out an hour for this. I'll definitely stay on as long as um, you have questions and want to hang out. But uh, out of respect for everyone's time, I'm, I'll really try and... Uh, uh, and push and get us at least through the core of it with an hour. Yeah. Um, so with that being said, uh, thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, this, is, this is something we considered doing um, probably about two months ago <clears throat> uh, uh, in the midst of uh, the shutdown and just wondering what kind of different things uh, we could do and Cara was kind enough to reach out uh, to want to involve me. And then, you know, with the, um, you know, really unfortunate and uh, reality of uh, George Floyd's murder on May 25th. Uh, I reached back out to Kara and said, look, I, I wanna do this. I wanna work with, with you and Simi, but I wanna do something that's going to, uh, you know, at least make some type of difference uh, and give back. And so we came up with uh, the July Winemaker Series, which uh, the last one is next Thursday, as Kara mentioned. And then we, we thought to do some blind tastings, but on different levels. So earlier today, we had one for um, you know, students that are actually going through examinations right now. <clears throat> uh, and then we thought to have this one that's just more friendly. Uh, quite honestly, this is more of um, less of a class and more just uh, a conversation. Uh, the goal for me here is, you know, I hope to give everyone sort of a framework in terms of uh, assessing wine, um, give you uh, a couple of uh, tools to maybe be better blind tasters but more so to just uh, kind of weaponize you or give you the ammunition to um, just go out there and assess wine and decide if you, you know, like it or not, and maybe figure out why you like it or why you don't and, and, and kind of go about it from there and certainly give you um, a, a platform to, to move on to other things should you wish to pursue it beyond that. <clears throat> so uh, I think one of the things that comes up more than anything else when we talk about blind tasting is why, you know, it really, um, especially with the Psalm movie coming out, what was that, eight years ago now? And, um, you know, all of the, the episodes and it's kind of like Psalms have become, you know, became rock stars overnight with that. But I do feel like there is a practical application to it. And that's why it's a part of the, the court of master sommeliers and the masters of wine program that you have to go through blind tasting. Um, you know, the big one for me is to just, you know, remove bias from it, like see what you really think about a wine um, based on you tasting it without any, any bias being presented other than the color of the wine in front of you. Um, the other part is it's good practice for, you know, for yourself, for your brain to verbalize what you're thinking versus writing it down. I think that's one of the hardest transitions for people to make from the certified sommelier exam to the advanced sommelier exam, and then after that is the master, is that instead of writing, uh, writing down your tasting, you actually have to verbally describe everything to, uh, to the proctors. And at the master level um, for the theory portion, you also have to verbalize it. And that's typically where people get tripped up is that, oh, like I can remember it, I can see the information right in front of me, but they can't verbalize it. And it's just using a different part of your brain. And, you know, and working in restaurants and speaking with guests, I think that's one of the most difficult things uh, or challenges I recognize with guests is just verbalizing what you like. And there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone, it's a skill. It's, it's a challenge for everyone. It's not unique. Um, and I hope to, you know, at least better that today. Uh, and then the other part is that it's, uh, I don't know, I just think it's fun and you can challenge yourself a little bit and, and it doesn't have to be too uh, doesn't have to be too serious. As a, a wine buyer or a wine director of restaurants, one thing that I did before we opened our most recent restaurant is 
for all of the wines by the glass um, in, our, in our bistro, which was the casual restaurant, um, I asked distributors or sales representatives to send us samples of wines in a certain category under, um, under a certain price point that we were looking at. And what we did was, um, I should have sent you a picture of this, Cara. What I did was we, I would line up anywhere from five to 15 glasses, depending on how many wines were in that category. I'd put them into uh, two ounce vials, put the sticker on the bottom, match the sticker to the bottle, and then mix up all the vials. Mm -hmm. Pour them into glasses and then just go through the wines and, and assess them. Um, you know, as simply as possible, but looking at, okay, does it seem correct for California Chardonnay? Yes or no? Um, do I like how it tastes? Yes or no? Um, how do I think guests are going to like this? Yes or no? It was, it was, you know, a very short assessment. And then at the end of it, I would pick the top three. And um, based on the top three, I would look at the price point and try to match quality to price based on our concept. So it definitely, you know, came into play for me as a, as a wine buyer um, and as a wine director because I wanted to give people the best wine uh, for the money and not just pick the ones that I thought would be the best. I wanted to actually see what, see what we could stand behind in terms of the quality. So there's certainly practical applications as a professional as much as there is um, as a student or just a, a casual consumer. Yeah. It's basically how we do it at Decant as well. Yeah, every Saturday we you know, we blind and we just talk about it, and I love that it keeps me on my toes. It keeps me somewhat sharp, um, but it's nice to it's it's you know I think it's it's not just good for the business, but it's also good for the consumer. Um, so with that, let's actually get into kind of the basics of wine tasting now that we have our goals set out for us. Cara, if you could, yeah, the next one. So the three things we're looking at uh, in blind tasting, how does it look? How does it smell? How does it taste? And then during, our, during those three phases, we're gathering evidence in those three stages. And at the end, we're making an educated guess based on information and evidence that's put in front of us or that we taste. And I say blind tasting is, I mean, it's like, it's like an instrument, it's like any other skill. Um, you're not born with it. It's not, uh, you know, you don't come out of the womb a, a blind taster. And for me, I knew it was going to be the most difficult part for me because I'm very self-conscious. I get into my own head a lot psychologically. And, you know, in that exam room, you're, you're very much by yourself. No one is speaking to you. Everyone's just staring at, staring at their paper, writing what you're saying. And it's a very, uh, uh, it's, it's much different than working in the service service side of it where you get to interact and kind of uh, be more of yourself. So with that, the first part with visual, um, really the, the main thing to take away from looking at a wine is I say the two most important are the color and then how intense is that color? And sure, there's other nuances, there's other little micro details that as you progress can become very valuable. But if you can get good at just looking at the color and intensity and understanding how color reflects different things and winemaking and, and, and vine growing and in different climates, you can do a lot of work in a very short amount of time. And at the, uh, at the, in the advanced and the master uh, sommelier exams, you get 25 minutes to go through six wines. And that's roughly four minutes and 10 seconds per wine. I tell you, generally, we spend about 10 seconds, 15 tops on the visual, and then we move on. So it's, you know, you're, you're noting a few things, but really um, most of the evidence gathering or stuff that's going to help you with the wine is going to come from smelling and tasting. So with that, with the visual, you'll see at the top, it says color, the type and the concentration of it. Uh, you'll see the italics of white and red. These are the types of colors that you'll generally find. And they're done in a spectrum from, uh, with whites, we look at the lightest color being pale straw. And then as we increase the color um, or develop more intensity of color, it goes to straw and then yellow and gold and amber. 
Um, whereas reds, whereas whites kind of gain color, reds will generally uh, lose color um, with age <clears throat> uh, or exposure to um, oxygen. So our spectrum for red wine color starts with, you know, most wines are, especially when they're young or fresh juice, it's a purple juice, but then we get into ruby, garnet, orange, and then eventually into brown. Um, you can look at the, the color of the rim, which can vary from the center, or it can be the same, and that can be evidence for you as to what the, the grape variety could be or the climate it comes from. Um, we won't get too much into the color and rim variation here. Uh, the next prong is particles, which, you know, in, in red wine, especially as it ages, some of you that um, if you've had a, an older red wine and noticed there was like crusty pieces on the cork or in the wine itself, that's a natural byproduct of aging. Uh, it's, it's sediment <clears throat> and it's essentially like tannin, the bitter compounds, as well as acid, the stuff that makes you salivate. It's just uh, um, a physical form uh, of that. Um, precipitating out of the wine. And then in white wines, you may notice gas, which uh, the wines today don't have that, but you, you may notice this in some whites that have a screw cap. Um, and that can be a slight hint as to what the wine is in terms of um, a blind tasting setting. And then the last part, which I'm sure everyone's heard about are the tears or the legs, which, you know, there's a lot of emphasis that's put on that. And I don't know that there's, um, a ton of value in it. You can certainly use it to your advantage, but there's a lot of things that can affect uh, tears or legs up to and including a dirty glass or a glass that hasn't been rinsed properly or um, properly polished. So you can have other things interfere with your ability to look at the legs or tears. And really for that reason, I tend to shy away from it. But um, as we get to the red wine, I'll, I'll point that out a little bit more. And that can certainly be a tool to um, uh, to help you in terms of identifying grape variety, winemaking, and uh, the region it comes from. So let's look at what we might get into with the nose. Now, before we actually start assessing any of these wines, the first thing I, I like to say with the nose is don't swirl the wine. Um, I know it seems, uh, you know, it seems sexy and like sensual and everyone likes to, you know, like swirl and make a big thing of it. But what actually happens when you swirl a wine, the, um, the, the benefit of it is it volatilizes these compounds in the wine and forces those aromas to, 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 to breathe and to, and, to, and to activate. But by doing that, you also may cover up uh, more subtle or delicate aromas in the wine um, because when the primary ones become activated, they're dominant. <clears throat> So before you swirl, I like to just smell at the edge of the glass or even tilt it. Smell at the, the edge, the center, the top, and kind of slowly move the glass because you'll notice different things at each uh, portion of the glass when you do. As you do sniff, um, try to take, you know, one or two second inhale when you do. And don't constantly sniff because that's actually going to desensitize you. Um, if you've ever been in a really smelly room, your college roommate, but then after five minutes you're used to it and don't smell anything, or you know someone that has a lot of cats, well, you know, they don't smell that anymore because they're used to it. And that's exactly what happens as you continue to smell the same thing over and over. Um, or even if you taste the same thing over and over, you literally will get... Um, kind of desensitized palate. And then in terms of what we're actually looking for in the nose, you know, I look for what's the intensity? Is this something that is very easy to smell? Or is it, um, <clears throat> you know, do I have to really search uh, for notes in the wine? Or does it like jump out, jump out of the glass like, you know, mom's perfume and you can smell it from a mile away? Um, we look at the uh, condition as well. Does it smell like a fruity wine or not? Um, and if it's not, then what does it smell like? And I think those are, you know, just the few basic questions you ask yourself when you smell a wine. And as far as what's below that, it's real. These are some of the different different notes for each category um, when we're smelling and tasting. 
So with fruits, um, in, in all of these, I say keeping it simple is best. So with fruits, I think about you know tree fruits, apple and pear and quince. I think about citrus, um, so lemon, lime, grapefruit, things of that nature, stone fruits and tropical fruits. And then for red wines, for me, is it, just, is it black, red, or blue? And some wines have all three. Some wines only have one, some have two. And that's, these are the tricks that, you know, students use when they're testing to deduce or get closer to the correct grape variety. Um, same thing with flowers, you know, keeping it simple, not necessarily like peonies and lilies and gardenias. For me, it's like, okay, are they, are they tree flowers? Are they citrus, you know, red, purple, or, you know, what are they? And, and try and keeping it as basic as possible. And so on and so forth through the rest of the categories until we've kind of gathered evidence and then we use all of that evidence to, um, to get to, the, to uh, an educated guess. So look at the, the palette, Cara. And the main thing for me, once we get to actually tasting the wine, is did anything change? You know, did I smell something and think one thing? And then as soon as I taste it, it's completely different or it's a little different. Um, or does it confirm everything that I was smelling? Uh, and then, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, I encourage, you know, people that are st um, studying or going for the exams, you know, make sure to spit the wine. It's actually um, can be kind of a nervous, nervous reaction to not spit the wine and to get so caught up in it and you forget to spit. And all the while you're becoming a little bit inebriated and you're losing your senses a bit. Um, it's, it's kind of a nervous reaction that I've observed. Uh, Does this thing also help you sort of taste more? Kind of like gives you like a sort of almost like a retro nasal element as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you um, you know when you hear you know super geeky nerdy wine people like swishing wine in their mouth and making all those noises, well, you know there is some um, there is value in that because you're you're bringing those uh, aromas and compounds to the back of your throat behind your nose, it's called the retronasal. And what we think we're tasting when we eat food or we drink uh, a beverage is actually mostly smell. And it's all happening in your, in your retronasal, retro like olfactory behind your tongue as those compounds get volat volatized and go up through the back of your nose, that's when you start to sense most of the flavors uh, that we think we're tasting. Um, so for that reason, the only thing I put here on the palate is structure, which are the objective things that we can actually taste um, without you know, being necessarily influenced by smell, or we don't need to smell them in order to um, feel them. So these are all sensations. And um, for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna, when we taste today, we're going to think about these, um, uh, these sensations on a scale of one to five. And the first thing we look at, and probably the easiest to perceive is, is it dry or is it sweet? And when you taste wines, you're going to, sweetness is generally in the front of the mouth, towards the front of the tongue, and is best or easiest sensed as soon as you taste the wine. The longer it sits in your mouth, the more saliva is, is being extracted and mixing with that liquid and starts to dilute sweetness. Now, if you're having a dessert wine or something that's clearly sweet, it's gonna persist and last, but something that might be just a little bit sweet, like say uh, a Chenin Blanc uh, or a Riesling or a Pinot Gris from France, uh, you may lose that after a few seconds. Uh, the next part is, is the body of the wine, and that's, you know, kind of how it feels in your mouth. And I think the best way to um, get acquainted with this or draw analogies is to think about the thickness of milk. So think about on like a one, uh, on a scale of one to five, a one would probably be something like skim milk. And then maybe a three would be low fat or 2% milk. And then, you know, a five is whole milk. Like that's full bodied, it's, it's creamy, it, you know, feels dense and plush in the mouth. And, and generally you wanna, you know, okay, it's, <clears throat> it's not whole milk, but it's not skim milk, so it's somewhere in the middle. 
And that's okay. You don't have to get it exact, but we want to give ourselves, you know, at least some evidence as we're tasting. Uh, the next one is acidity, and that's just that's a salivation reaction. So think about when you, you know, you take that shot of tequila and then you take a bite of a lime um, or lemon juice or anything that's really sour. Um, that reaction from your mouth is protecting your teeth. Uh, it's protecting your teeth from the acid of the wine or uh, fruit that would otherwise rip the enamel um, off of your teeth and out of your mouth. So you salivate in reaction to that. So the more acid in the wine, the more you're going to salivate, particularly after you spit it out. And I assess acidity when I'm tasting after I spit out the wine, how quickly do I salivate? And the quicker I salivate, the more acid I'm processing in the wine. Um, tannin is just, it's bitterness. It can come from fruit. It can come from oak as well, if you're using new oak barrels. And I think the best um, analogy I like to think about here is like think about the finish on, a, on bourbon because they're generally using new American oak. And American oak has lots of tannin in the wood and it leaves this really like bitter, dry feeling um, after, you know, after you spit or, um, uh, or consume it. But that's what we're referring to when we say tannins. And lastly, with alcohol, alcohol, I'm sure everyone knows, is that, you know, gives you that burning sensation. And for me, a scale of one to five, you know, a one is you kind of feel it right here, just in your cheeks and retronasal. And then a three would probably be like, you know, in the neck, along the collarbone, you feel it right here. And then if, it, if it's got alcohol, if it's, you know, especially like think about a shot of tequila or a shot of any spirit, you feel it like in your chest, it like burn, it fills your whole body and you, know, you have that, that whole sensation. Now, you don't typically get that from wine because, you know, you don't have too many wines that are above 14 or 15% alcohol, but you can, you can start to get a, a range on that scale of one to five. So now we're all going to practice a little bit and we're gonna, <clears throat> We're gonna do the white wines, and for the sake of comparison and practice, I'd like to actually compare um, wine one and wine two and go through that exercise um, of looking at the site, of smelling it and tasting it. So Cara, if you could leave it on the slide for a while so that we don't reveal just yet. Yep. Um, let's everybody um, look at the wines against a white background. And these look fairly similar in the glass, but you'll, you may notice that <clears throat> the uh, second wine, uh, wine two, um, has just a little bit deeper color. It's also got more of a uh, yellow, like gold hue, whereas the first wine, really more straw, pale yellow. So in terms of, um, uh, you know, intensity, we might think of wine one as having an intensity of three on the one to five scale. And then we could probably put wine two as like a four, you know, flirting with five in terms of intensity of color. And that alone tells you, um, can tell you, um, can give you lots of hints. Uh, wines that are, white wines that are aged uh, in oak, like new, say new French oak or new American oak, um, that intensifies color because as white wine comes into contact uh, with oxygen over, um, over an extended time, it will actually deepen or darken in color. And uh, oak itself also has color um, compounds in it. So the longer alcohol, which is a solvent, uh, dissolves those compounds in the oak, it will end up in the wine and you will get a deeper color. And again, the analogy here is bourbon is clear when it goes into the barrel. By the time it's bottled, it's not clear at all. And that's a function of, you know, some people adding, you know, caramel coloring, but it's uh, largely a part of aging uh, in oak. And that's what um, oak can do for you, both flavor and color-wise. Now that we have that, we'll keep it very simple um, <clears throat> uh, on the... On the, on the visual, but let's give these a smell. So wine one, 
And again, don't swirl just yet. Uh, if everyone has the ability to participate, I'd like you to put in the chat whether you think this is, is this a fruity wine to you or is it other things? So you have a, there's no wrong answer, but, and everyone's different. So Rick says fruity, Brianna has floral. Fruity. Okay. <clears throat> In terms of uh, fruits, the next, yeah, I love that pear and green apple. Absolutely. So now we want to think about fruits are, don't just come as one flavor, right? They don't just, they aren't perfectly ripe every time you pick them or get them from the store. You could have a very like sour, tart, underripe green apple or you could have like a really ripe kind of sweet, luscious green apple um, and everything in between. So do we think that in terms of the fruits, are these more like, are they underripe? Are they tart? Are they ripe? Or are they like, you know, rich and like raisinated have seen a lot of sun? So what does everyone think that said fruity? Tart, love it. I agree. I think this is this is more tart fruit. So that is um, this is a uh, yeah tart underripe. Absolutely. You know this isn't like green apples that are falling from the tree because they've been there too long and now they're rotting on the ground. It's like these are green apples or pears that yeah you could probably eat them now maybe for like a crunchy hard texture in a salad probably not going to be super enjoyable unless you like all that like bright kind of green apple acid that underripe apples have. So we can use that in our um, uh, as evidence to point to where these grapes were grown in terms of the climate and perhaps how the wine was made as well. Now generally in say a climate, um, I think most everyone is on the call is in California except, except one. But if you think about uh, Napa and Sonoma, like you get fairly hot. I mean, you can get over 100 degrees for multiple days in a row. Um, we don't get super, super cold. You know, we have this long Indian summer. So you usually aren't going to get fruit like this from wine one in a climate like Napa or Sonoma. It's usually going to be something from a cooler climate, like say, you know, parts of France or other parts of Europe um, that can't really get grapes ripe over a four or five month period. Now, let's all smell wine two and maybe note if there's any difference. Like what is wine two fruity? Is it earthy, floral? What jumps out? What's the first thing that comes to mind for anyone that wants to throw it out there on the chat? Or you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Really? Oak and butter. Ooh. Oak, butter. Love that, I love butter. This just tick brings me right back home. Okay, so, um, yeah, absolutely. Everyone has a, a different palette. Everyone's glasses, environment, everything are different. Um, so definitely throw out any flavors that you get. But I'm gonna focus on those two things, oak and butter. Now, oak, certainly a, a winemaking uh, and butter are both things that are a function primarily of winemaking. So this is a choice by someone to use oak in the winemaking process and butter is a function <clears throat> of another fermentation that can happen um, and is often done in very specific wines. So I'm not going to reveal this wine or what wines it's done on because I don't want to lead anyone in a certain direction. But as a sommelier or a blind taster or someone, you know, having fun at home, this is what can help you eliminate many possibilities and hone in on, you know, a few, um, because that's what we're trying to do. You know, think about the wines as, um, you know, five or six criminals in, their, in the lineup, and we're trying to pick out the one that committed the crime. 
but we're not, we want to eliminate as much as possible so that what can only be left is the person that did it. And that's what I try to think about in blind tasting. We're collecting evidence and trying to eliminate possibilities because of evidence. If I ask you to pick a number between one and a hundred, well, the first thing I'll do is say, is it more or less than 50? I'm going to try and cut out as many possibilities as possible. If you say, oh, it's more than 50, I mean, is it more or less than 75? And so on and so forth. So it's, it's, a, game of, uh, it's a game of elimination, or at least that's, that was always my strategy uh, going into tasting. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> now that we've smelled them and just have kind of um, uh, the primary things that came at us, we have wine one that is tart, green apples, green pears, and then we, with two, we have oak and butter, and I'm cer certainly there's more that will come out when we taste it. Let's <clears throat> taste wine one, hold it in your mouth for two or three seconds. Don't swish it like mouthwash, but move it around the mouth just kind of slowly. And then if you want to spit, by all means, if you don't, by all means. And then tilt your head down when you do, after you've swallowed it or spit it, and count how long, less than a second, more than a second, more than two seconds until you salivate. Kara, what did you get? Oof, I was, I was salivating as soon as I spit that out. Yeah, I mean, that was the half second tops. <clears throat> I felt that up behind my ears. <laughs> Does everyone feel that? Super acidic. Very acidic. Exactly. So that's when, when sommeliers or other, you know, when winemakers or other people talk about acidity, that's acidity in wine. Okay. And acidity as grapes ripen, <clears throat> start with lots and lots of acid, just like any other fruit. Um, when they're not ripe, they have lots of acid. Um, and they're also generally pretty bitter too, especially if you eat the seeds. And you know, if, if you ask the question why, and a lot of things in life, it'll, it'll, it'll lead you closer to the truth. And if we ask the question why, why do grapes have acid in this case? Well, acid's not very fun, right? It's not, um, it's not a very fun thing to consume, uh, uh, particularly if there's bitterness with it. This is how grapes survive. It's how they protect their seeds until they're ready to eat and they have the best chance possible to uh, reproduce. If a bird or a squirrel or something comes and eats it, you know, uh, leaves the seeds somewhere else uh, when they're done with it, those seeds have a better chance of survival. So acid is a kind of a protective uh, method for the grape in addition to tannins. And we'll, we'll get into that um, at, when we talk about the red. <clears throat> but also um, each grape has different levels. Um, when, it is, when it is fully ripe, there's some grapes that will still have lots of acid and others that won't have very much at all. So just based on that assessment alone, that one thing, it tells us a lot about what this wine could be. We haven't even talked about flavors or you know, what the alcohol is or if there's oak or anything else, but just because there's lots of acid, that helps us a lot with this wine. Now, um, sticking with this, what is, um, let's taste it again and get a feel for the body. Is this skim milk? Is it 2% like uh, a three out of five or is this whole milk? five out of five, like full lush texture. Does anyone want to throw out a, throw out a number between one and five? One being the least, five being the highest? It's like a one or two percent. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, rice milk, soy milk, coconut. Yeah, I love that. I mean, this is like almost like um, like goat's milk for me. <laughs> like very like like sour and lean and like yeah. I think we're in the you know it's definitely not more than three. And I you know that gives us a lot of information. Mm -hmm. um, I think absolutely depending on how you react to tart wines, this can absolutely feel like one. I'm I think anywhere in that one to three camp is is spot on. 
but I think we're like really honing in on that one or two. Like this is lean, tart, refreshing. Certainly would want to drink it on a hot summer day. Um, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, let's let's leave it at that. We've got lots of acidity and we've got very little body. Are there any flavors for anyone that jumps out? Fruit, flowers, any herbs, any spices? Maybe one or two things if anyone has something on the tip of their tongue. Mm. Fruits, non-fruits, spice, herbs. Yeah, okay. we've got the apple, we've got the pear. Does anyone, um, let's talk about herbs. Does anyone um, have any like herbs that jump out? I think there is kind of a green herbal tone in the wine. And that can give us a lot of clues. Does it remind does it remind you of anything that you've eaten or smelled recently? Tarragon. Ooh. I love that. Yeah, it's very like <clears throat> kind of like fresh, not like resinous herbs, but like mm. Mm -hmm. Like watercress, crunchy, green mm -hmm. herbs. Um, maybe almost like a little bit of like jalapeno or green pepper, mm -hmm. bell pepper, just a little bit. Does so anyone like, like spicy margaritas? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Bell peppers, pepper salad, stuff like that. So this wine, um, it has a compound in it and we'll, we'll come back to it after we taste wine too but it absolutely has like a jalapeno green pepper element. And that is also a function uh, of a compound that you can find in grapes. If you were to taste this grape in the vineyard, it would taste like jalapeno and bell pepper. And it's, it's something that exists in the grape before it even gets turned into wine. And when you get good at it, when you get enough practice, at identifying these types of compounds, just noting that in this wine is gonna eliminate a ton of other possibilities. And again, that we are using that with the, the tart fruit and that like kind of tart acid and then that lean texture, that skim milk texture we talked about, and it has green pepper notes in it. We're in very, very, very few places in the world and very, very, very few grapes that this could possibly be. So you're going to notice this every time you ever have a wine like this ever again. You're, oh, yeah. now that you're learning to recognize it, you're always going to recognize it. When we yeah. talk about citrus too. We can't forget to say how much like lime and lemon there is in this too. Yeah, it's very, um, I mean, we didn't get too much into the citrus or stone fruit aspect of it, but like peach pit and like white underripe peach pit, um, lemon and lime zest, a lot of like white grapefruit, things like that. Um, but all, regardless of the fruit that you call out here, I think the condition is most important. And again, it's tart, kind of sour fruit, underripe fruits. We're not talking about, um, you know, rich, sweet stuff. So we're going to put wine one on the back burner for now. Let's go to wine two. Let's taste it and let's do the same thing. So hold it in your mouth for a few seconds, spit or swallow, depending on your uh, preference. And we'll go from there. Okay, sweet or dry? Who wants to throw it out there? <clears throat> Is this sugar or not sugar? We think uh, on the sweeter side. Okay. Okay. Slightly yeah. sweet. Okay. okay. And we're gonna we'll we'll come back to that too because I think there's another thing at play. Now is this, is it um, one through five, is it skim milk, low fat, or whole milk? Especially in comparison to the first one. I saw a hand come up on an on-screen with a, with a big five. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Rick says four. Uh-huh. 
<clears throat> let's say what it's not. Yeah. It's not one. Yeah. It's not yeah. skim milk. It's probably not even low fat. Like this is, you know, it's four or five. And I like to, again, it doesn't have to be four or five. We just need to acknowledge and recognize that this is full. Like this is elevated. It's not wine one. Um, it's the complete opposite of that. So as long as we know that, that gives us also lots of clues. <clears throat> now with this one, um, we didn't do it on wine one, but I think it's more um, relevant for wine two. I saw that little uh, flash. Right. So let's taste it again, leave it for two or three seconds. When you spit um, or um, after you've consumed it, take a like breathe in and note where you feel, if any, um, a little burning sensation. And that'll give us um, uh, an idea about alcohol. Where are you at, Cara? <clears throat> I think I'm at a three and a half, four here. Yeah. Yeah, it feels a little warm in the back of my throat when I do that breathe in. You can kind of feel it going down your esophagus a little bit, a little bit of a, a light burn. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm like right here, you know, top yeah. of the sternum. I definitely, I feel it like in my ears and like my throat and all the way down. I breathe in pretty hard. I don't know about you. Um, <clears throat> but it's, I'd say it's, it's more prominent than wine one. For sure. Let's let's go back and taste wine one really quick. Do the same thing and see the difference, if any. Comparatively, where do you guys feel? So let's take a vote. Who think um, one wine one or wine two? Which one do you think has more alcohol or more of that burning sensation? Yeah, we think two. two. All of us think two. two. Yeah. And I'll give you the alcohols after, just for reference. <clears throat> two looks like we're all on the train number two. Yeah. Okay. So the first wine, it says on the label thirteen and a half percent. Yeah. I think I think they're lying a little bit. Who knows? But uh, thirteen and a half, and then the wine two is fourteen and a half. So as far as the label is concerned, it is co uh, correct. Wine two has more alcohol. So now the reason I bring that up is for those that um, mentioned that there was a slight sweetness. Um, alcohol is a sugar, right? So particularly in wines like say a Napa Cabernet um, that's richer and fuller in style that might be 15% alcohol or more. On paper, like technically that wine might be completely dry. There is no sugar left in it. But because of the elevated alcohol, alcohol is glycerol and it has this coating kind of sweet type of um, sensation on the palate. It touches a lot of the same um, uh, receptors. So even though the wine uh, is dry, there's, you know, there's no sugar in the wine per se, um, it feels sweet. It's also a function of the fruit um, feeling, the fruit being riper in, in a warmer climate. So you can use that to your um, uh, advantage in blind tasting, but also, you know, when you're out at a restaurant and <clears throat> We'll, we'll review the, reveal the wines in just a moment. Um, but when you're out at a restaurant and you say, you know, I, I want this grape, but not one that's really like buttery or oaky or, you know, sweet or fruit forward, then that kind of gives um, a sommeliers uh, or whoever might be helping you a little bit of a tool to, to help you. Um, or quite frankly, when you're tasting yourself and decide what you like or not, maybe you know a little bit more about that why. So does anyone want to take a stab at wine one? 
We think it's a Sauv Blanc. Oh, okay. is, that the, is that a non and crew? Yes. Okay. It is. Let me. Uh, yeah, we think Sauvignon Blanc, and then there's another gas, maybe. Right? Maybe Pinot Grigio. Uh, yeah, and then probably, the other. Probably or, Sauv Blanc. Or you said a Chenin Blanc. Yeah, yeah so we're split Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, and Pinot Grigio. Okay. Absolutely. Coming a lot of territory. <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're going to guess them all, and one of us will be right. No, that's great. And How about, you know, how about uh, Rick? What do you think? I'm going to go say it's clearly a white wine. <laughs> Perfect. Absolutely. You are 100% correct. <laughs> OK, so before we reveal one, there is, um, we mentioned that green pepper jalapeno element. <clears throat> So these, this is a compound called <clears throat> um, methoxypyrazine, or pyrazines for short. Pyrazines are compounds that exist in um, a certain subset of grapes, most of them coming from Bordeaux. So think about Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, uh, Petit Verdot, um, Merlot has a bit of it too. I feel like I'm missing one, but that's okay. Um, Sauvignon Blanc uh, is also in that family. Sauvignon Blanc is one of the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but my point is, pyrazines are a, a method for these grapes to defend themselves from predators before the seeds are ripe. So if you taste a Sauvignon Blanc grape, which that is what this is, um, you, in the vineyard, you will taste pyrazines. And you'll note under the herbal slash green uh, part of the tasting note or kind of general tasting note is green bell pepper. And if you can pick out this compound in red and or and white wines, uh, it can eliminate so many um, uh, possibilities for grapes that don't have that compound in terms of blind tasting. It's also good to know if you if you like this wine and you like this flavor, or you don't, if you absolutely abhor like pepper taste in your wine, um, when you're ordering Sauvignon Blanc, you, you could describe that to, um, you know, the wine buyer at the retail shop or the sommelier working on the floor at the restaurant and to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I like, I enjoy Sauvignon Blanc, but I want more of the tropical citrus flavors that come from a riper style and not so much of the bell pepper that you might find in Sancerre, which is where this wine comes from. So I know everyone has the, the bottles uh, in front of you, but this is um, definitely one of the more classic and prominent producers in Sancerre. So this is a region in the Loire Valley of France. It is certainly the, the home of Sauvignon Blanc, um, you know, in terms of setting the bar for the rest of the world. I'd imagine uh, maybe everyone's had some experience with New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. That's 100% another part of the world that has taken on <clears throat> to the grape in the past, you know, 40 to 50 years. And, the, you know, you certainly see some here uh, in California, but it really, you know, the, the home base for it is Loire Valley. Imagine this, all that acidity and tartness and just how refreshing it is. And then you have this with like really tart um, goat cheese, which is, you know, pretty prominent in Lamar. Imagine this with really herbal pâtés and things like that. And you get a sense for, you know, the cuisine to go along with the food and why Sauvignon Blanc is so, is so popular there. So this is a very classic example of an old world Sauvignon Blanc. And you mentioned that with in New Zealand, you tend to get a little bit more of the tropical, the, um, the green bell pepper can kind of move into sort of like a cilantro jalapeno and the citrus fruit is way more ruby red grapefruit than this sort of like lime and, and uh, green apple. But then in Bordeaux, we also see Sauvignon Blanc, but it's a very specific style. And this kind of goes a little bit about what we were talking about with body and that changes a little bit, right? In Bordeaux for Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, um, well, you'll typically see in Bordeaux, I'm sure everyone, uh, if, if you haven't heard of uh, Sauternes, which is a, a very classic dessert wine uh, from Bordeaux in France, um, 
they will use Sauvignon Blanc as well as another grape called Semillon uh, to blend together. They also make dry white wines, which are becoming more popular um, even so now, because our generation uh, you know, really isn't drinking a lot of sweet wine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But um, typically because Semillon is blended in, Semillon gives you this waxy kind of round um, texture and it helps can help balance out some of that tart um, citrus fruit that Sauvignon Blanc uh, is known for. Mm -hmm. um, I know, so we had uh, Chenin Blanc and Pinot Grigio. I think the main things for both of those grapes that Sauvignon Blanc has and they don't is that pyrazine component. Um, you won't find, you know, bell pepper and, and these types of flavors in Chenin or Pinot Grigio. Um, Chenin Blanc, at least, is also from the Loire Valley in France and certainly still has that puckery, like acid, that tart flavor. Um, but oftentimes you'll find at least a little bit of sugar in Chenin Blanc because it has so much acid. So acid and sweetness uh, balance each other. Um, if you ever uh, measured uh, Coca-Cola for the amount of sugar in it, um, if they didn't put acid, enough acid in there to balance it, you would vomit after drinking Coca-Cola because there's so much sugar in it. And that's, you know, it's, um, um, that's not a joke. There is, uh, there's quite a bit in it. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a way for um, sometimes winemakers will actually add sugar or add acid in to balance these things, you know, to make the wine more appealing. And certainly we see that with juices and things like that on the market outside of wine. So it's not, um, it's not unique to just wine. So okay. Sauvignon Blanc is an interesting grape that can have this light, bright tartness. It can have a big citrus quality. It can be aged in oak. It can be sweet. Um, in California, sometimes you'll see all three styles available. You'll see the sort of, this sort of style in producers that are trying to make something a little bit lighter, more refreshing from people like Honig or Heights or San Supri. And then you have the other style that you might see called Fumé Blanc, which is made more in this white Bordeaux style that sees oak. And it tends to be a little bit, little bit fuller bodied. Um, <laughs> But Sauvignon Blanc is, is very, very versatile, so keep trying them. But the one thing, like he said, you'll always find is that tart citrus and that some form of green bell pepper. That's how you'll always know it's Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, so if someone's putting wines in front of you and you're blinding, that's a good way to, uh, to eliminate possibilities. Um, and as Cara mentioned, in a warmer climate like we have in, say, Napa, it's a stylistic choice because we have such a long growing season that you can make this style if you want to. I think it's really difficult to actually because we have so much sunshine. But the other side of that is you can ripe, ripen Sauvignon Blanc so much that you lose most of that green flavor and you'll get more into like this passion fruit, guava, ripe melon tone. And you know, there's everything in between. So we certainly have the, the full palette in California. In France, it tends to be much more of um, kind of the, the leaner side. And Sancerre is the name of the village that it's from. That's how you always know. Wine number two? Well, was, yeah, so we, yeah, Chenin Blanc, Pinot Grigio, just to recap, don't have those, um, don't have those compounds and I'm happy to expand more on that via email or at the end, um, but there's, there's a lot of things that'll help you uh, separate those wines apart. So wine two, which we tasted through all the way. Do we want to throw out any um, possibilities there? Mm. We, Chardonnay. <laughs> we, yeah, Chardonnay <laughs> would be the obvious one. Chardonnay. That was come out of my nose. Thank you. <clears throat> I feel good about that. Um, you know, we really kind of we said some very important things about this wine. That there's oak that there's kind of a butter component. Um, I think we could talk all day about just the ripeness of the fruit and the spices that are here, and like cinnamon and <clears throat> like cinnamon and caramel and toffee and all these wonderful things. But the fact that we have new oak in this wine gives us very, very, very few possibilities for where the wine could come from. Because um, first and foremost, uh, French oak is expensive. I mean, you have barrels 
that fits, um, I mean, 225 liters roughly, which isn't a ton of wine. That's maybe 25 cases, 300 bottles. You do the math. But uh, I want to say, I th think Kara is from Dave Yoshida. He had mentioned to me, because he has worked a few harvests, and he said, a barrel of French oak adds about three or four bottles to the, to the, the three or four dollars to the cost per bottle, like just baseline. So for places in the world that historically didn't really have um, the, the wealth or the financial means to age their wines in new oak barrels, um, it kind of historically created a style for those wines, like the Sauvignon Blanc from Sancerre, you generally are not gonna see new French oak for those wines um, to age in. Whereas for Chardonnay, which uh, correctly identified, that is, um, can certainly be a classic because that started, started in Burgundy. It has centuries of winemaking history. And then we as Americans kind of took that, um, that knowledge and brought it back in the 70s and 80s to Napa Valley and, and to the Russian River, and it really just kind of blew up from there. So you'll notice the bolded section of these notes um, right in the center, uh, malolactic notes, butter, yogurt, cream, the, the bottom oak, um, toffee, caramel, butterscotch, baking spice. Um, this, these are typically very polarizing flavors for people. So if you're in the I don't like Chardonnay camp. I find most uh, guests that uh, say that are generally people that are um, averse to these types of flavors. But it's not really the fault of Chardonnay, it's the impact of the winemaker. Mm -hmm. Chardonnay is a very, um, is a fairly neutral grape variety. It doesn't give you a ton of, you know, flavors on its own, which is what makes it the perfect kind of blank canvas for winemakers to do these different things to to create their own style and oak uh, is certainly one of them <clears throat> uh, malolactic so this refers to another fermentation that can or doesn't have to happen uh, but it can happen in wine where you're converting uh, malic acid which is what you find in like green apples to a lactic acid which is the type of acid you find in milk typically makes the wine a little bit softer and creamier um, and not as harsh on the palate. So it makes that uh, Sancerre, this, you know, probably didn't go through malolactic, but if it did, it wouldn't be as, you know, sharp and green. <clears throat> um, so these are uh, two of many techniques winemakers can use to kind of impart texture and style uh, into Chardonnay. Um, this is, I'm sure everyone's revealed, so David Ramey, his Russian River Valley Chardonnay, the 2018. I mean, David is, you know, iconic California winemaker, has, has, has been around the block in terms of, um, both in France and in California, in terms of honing his winemaking expertise. And, you know, I think this is like 100% a perfect, like classic example of, Russian River Valley Chardonnay. And it isn't, you know, d despite the kind of intense flavors here, this, it can get much heavier if, if winemakers choose to. You can also get much lighter and have them like kind of a lighter, fragrant, leaner or lighter style of California Chardonnay. And I feel like this fits, you know, kind of maybe not somewhere in the middle, a little bit, a little bit towards the heavier ends, but it's certainly not um, the heaviest. And, even though it says, you know, 14 and a half percent alcohol on the label, which uh, is, you know, that's, that's pretty high for white wine. It doesn't, you know, feel like it, it doesn't like, it isn't harsh and burning. It feels all very well balanced and integrated into the wine. And that's just a, um, <clears throat> a, a nod to David's expertise as a winemaker. Um, so when we talk about Chardonnay, we have this sort of style, which is very classic style, very well done classic style of, you know, the California full bodied Chardonnay. But then you get into the other styles like Champagne, which doesn't see these notes of yogurt, creme fraiche or butter or Chablis from mm -hmm. Northern Burgundy, which also doesn't really see these elements. My 
dead. Hello. Yeah. We're oh, okay. Sorry, my thing was like frozen. Um, oh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Go back. Uh, which is like, which is really, really interesting. So when you look, when you look down this um, on the screen, and you see sort of like slight limestone low minerality, that um, definitely is for like the style of wine. But then when you go into sort of Chablis or the Chardonnay that's put into Champagne, you're getting really much more high minerality. And that's all again, because we're talking about super cool climates, kind of like how we were talking about the Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. So there's a, when people say they don't like Chardonnay. I'm like, well, you like to drink champagne? Because that's Chardonnay, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's almost akin to saying, well, I don't like music. Well, it's, I mean, there's a lot of music out there. I'm sure we can find one for you. You know, it's um, maybe not that simple. But I think if it, you would almost have to go so far as to say, I don't like white wine. And that's more fair than saying I don't like Chardonnay. If you drink white wine, I think we can find a Chardonnay that you would like. Yeah. I think it is a personal, for personal endeavor. Chardonnay is the most planted grape in the world. Am I wrong? Most planted white grape in the world. Most planted white grape in the world. So there's a lot of styles for a lot of different people. Um, red, getting into red wine, I find red wine much easier to blind taste than white wine. Yeah, red wine has a lot more um, evidence to give us. And I think styles tend to, it's easier to split the hairs than, um, uh, than with white wine. And you know, that starts right off the bat with just the color of it. There's a lot more variation and different types of color that are easier um, and more readily apparent to see in red wine. So, you know, you saw the gamut of pale straw to amber with whites. Now we're looking at um, uh, colors like purple, ruby and then as the wine has aged longer um, in bottle or before it was um, before it was bottled if it was aged in oak you might see more of these ruby or garnet tones and then with particularly extended aging um, you might get orange or you know sadly hopefully the wine is still good um, but even some brown uh, brown color and then <clears throat> much more so in red wine uh, there may be a difference of the color of the rim, which we call the, the rim variation. And that can tell you um, about grape variety. It can tell you about climate. Um, it's really, there's, there's a whole mix of evidence that we can get from that. Um, in terms of particles, as I mentioned earlier, sediment, which is something that's a, just a byproduct of, of aging. Um, sediment may form. Uh, it happens throughout the winemaking process. Winemakers are actually letting sediment fall to the bottom of the barrel. They take the liquid off the top, that's called racking, and then they'll put it into the bottle from there. But you'll still see that happen in the bottle as wines age. So if you've ever had a 10 or 20 year old red wine, um, you may notice some sediment. Uh, it's harmless. Um, certainly if you are enjoying aged red wine, <clears throat> I uh, encourage you not to shake it up before you open it, but you know, if you enjoy it, by all means. Um, it's more of an aesthetic thing. And then what really comes into play more so with red wines are the tears or the legs. And you know, as you roll the wine in the glass or, and, you, and you look at it through a background, you can see the tears as they fall. They may have some color attached to it, and if there's color in the legs, that can give you a clue as to, you know, the amount of extraction or type of climate um, or grape variety. So it doesn't all point to one thing, but it can give you some, some clues. So let's, um, let's smell this. And does this, everyone can just give a quick vote. Is this uh, a fruity wine or you know, other stuff. Yeah, we think other other stuff, like funk, it's kind of like funky. Mm-hmm. Mm, kind of uh, like Amaro to me. Mm. Like all those like really wild like spices and herbs that you get in Amaros. I think we could pull fruit out of here, absolutely. And we're going to, but um, I don't think fruit is the dominant factor here and I'm glad we're all on the same page. 
So why don't we go through the other categories since it's our last line and you know, what do we get? Does anyone pick up flowers? Any types of flowers? And just think, you know, in terms of red, black, purple, are they fresh, are they dried? Lots of warming spices. Yeah, they'd be dried. dried. Yeah, if anything, dried. Red flowers. Kind of smoky, dried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of like brushy, dried flowers. <clears throat> so that can give us an indication to the grape and or how it's aged. What about herbs? Are these, <clears throat> do we get any? Are they more like French countryside herbs? Are they more like Tuscan Italian herbs? Are they dried? Are they fresh? Are they boiled? Fennel. Fennel. Italian herbs. Italian. I love it. I, I get, I get like something peppery, like just black pepper. Yeah, it's totally like a like a peppery. It's like chili flake. Tobacco. 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 I love that. Now. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of earth, I say organic and inorganic, um, and this, you know, can apply to white wine, but has more to do with reds. Organic earth is thinking of like living soil, like compost and, and leaves and forest floor, stuff that's kind of constantly changing. And inorganic is like rock, you know, it, it's or concrete or cement or wet rocks or slate like it's not really something that's changing on a daily basis or in the grand scheme of thing over millions of years it'll change but it's not really a living organism um, so do we get kind of any of those things here i'd say maybe some organic earth what do you think cara yeah definitely some like uh kind of like composty soil. And with that, I'd also say like dried mushrooms or some, I put that in with like that sort of organic earth sort of characteristic. Not quite forest floor, but definitely a little damp soil stuff is growing. Totally. So when we look at, when we look at earthen wines, the intensity of it, I mean, I, I'll go ahead and say, I think we're probably about the three to four, like in terms of the amount of earth here. And that can help us, you know, decide where we might take the wine. You're generally not going to get incredible, like a lot of earth, uh, especially organic earth in say California or Washington or Australia or South Africa, these places that we classify outside of Europe as the, the new world, so to speak. Whereas in Europe or what we say is the old world, it's you know fairly common to to get wines that might be driven more by earth and herbs and flowers than they would be by fruit mm -hmm. so that's the whole point of asking does everyone think this is a fruit driven wine or something else if it's something else okay we might be in the old world let's really explore that a bit more so definitely some organic earth here and now vince is that part of because again talking about climate the fruit cannot really get so ripe and overripe that we're, we're sort of letting all of these other elements come out. Yes and no. Um, that's, I think that's one of those maybe a, a bit more complicated. You can, um, uh, I think it's attributed more to uh, traditions as well. And that's a whole other like can of worms. Um, I would say it has more to do with winemaking tradition and less to do with um, uh, less to do with the climate per se. Okay, very cool. Um, so, you know, would I don't, you know, does anyone get like new oak? So new oak in like say the white wine in the Chardonnay presents itself as like vanilla and butter and caramel and butterscotch. In red wine, it tends to be more of these can be like dark, toasty, baking spice, um, sometimes even like barbecue or char or smoke. Does anyone pick up much of that here? Or do we think it's kind of other spices? Are we tasting like vanilla and chocolate and things like that in this wine? We think other stuff. Yeah, we think other 
Uh, yeah, not that. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> We're kind of struggling. No, that's good. Um, believe me, I've said out loud in tastings in my exams that, okay, I don't know what this wine is, but this is what is there, you know, and just kind of push it back to, okay, I'm only looking at evidence. And you're absolutely right. There's no, I don't think there's any clear evidence here of toast and smoke and char and chocolate and coffee, all of these things that might indicate to us that there is new French oak or any type of new oak on the wine. Um, I think we, you know, we had already kind of mentioned some spices earlier and we won't get into, uh, into secondaries because I think that's, you know, that's just, that's straying away from the topic. I want to taste the wine. I don't know about you. So let's give it a taste and know that while we're tasting red wine, we also have to factor in much more so the tannins or the bitterness after we swallow the wine or after we spit it out. So give it a taste. Dry or sweet? Anyone want to throw out a vote? Dry, sweet? Dry. 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 This is like dry to the nth degree. This is what we call bone dry. Like yeah, yeah. a scale of one to five dry, this is zero. Like this very, is- Very, very puckery. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so we've got our dryness. Let's taste again for the acid. And when you spit or when you swallow, dip your head down and let's count each of us how long it takes to salivate. All right, where are you at? about like a one two like two seconds and my mouth was very wet trying to get rid of that grip I'm trying to move trying through. To talk to you. hold on <laughs> i'm still going yeah it lasts for a long time but it hits it hits me very quickly yeah it's like boom it's instant and it's persistent so we know it's not one it's definitely more than three so if you say this is probably four or five yeah, I would say it's, you know, this for me is a five, but if you're four or five, like, that's where we want to be. We yeah. want to know what it's not. Moderate plus high acid. Okay, so <clears throat> the next thing we'll take a look at is that we didn't in the first two wines is bitterness, because mm -hmm. we're going to have to think about tannins for all red wines, because these <clears throat> big, big clues about the winemaking, about the grape, about the climate, and ultimately what it could possibly be. So let's taste it. And this one's definitely more difficult to, um, I think, communicate over virtual, um, over a seminar. But for me, it's, am I completely dry after? Do I, I feel like I just tried to swallow cinnamon? Can I, do I still feel somewhat refreshed? Um, or do I feel no bitterness at all? And that's roughly the scale that I look at with tannins. So let's give it a taste. Yeah, there's some tannin. I feel it like mostly on my tongue, like a little bit on my teeth. Mm -hmm. So, um, for reference, kind of feels that. like sucking on a tea bag, mm -hmm. like frying. Yeah, and if you know, I'm glad you said that. A great exercise for tannins, and you know, do this next time if you're a tea drinker, um, particularly for black tea. You know, do a do a couple of cups. Steep one for 30 seconds, steep one for a minute, steep one for a minute and a half and two minutes and feel the progression or that build of drying sensation uh, with each cup. And that, that's the best way to train or not the best way, but one of many ways you can train um, for tannin if you don't have a lot of wine uh, to do it on necessarily. But for me, um, you know, tannin's tricky. It can, it can, again, it can come from grape skins. It can also come from oak. So we have to kind of consider, is this one or the other, or is it both? And in this case, we didn't smell any oak. I don't really taste any either. So this is mostly fruit tannin. And that can tell you also be a hint for where in the world it could come from in terms of winemaking tradition. And now, where does fruit tannin come from? 
So it comes from uh, comes from the skins themselves. Um, you can get tannin from if you've ever bit into a stem, like on like grape stems. If you've ever bit into a seed by accident, like it can be extremely bitter. But for the most part, winemakers are avoiding those tannins. They're really trying to get them from the skins without breaking seeds or stems to get those really bitter kind of green tannins. Um, yeah. So let's do the last one, and that's the, the alcohol. So everyone take a taste, spit, swallow, and then breathe in deep. And in this case, we can use the white wines as our barometer. <clears throat> Is this more or less than wine one in terms of how it feels? Less. Yeah, as, it's to less. me, to us, like me, yeah, less or the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then how about compared to wine two? Way more. Yeah, way less, we think. Yeah, I, I, I perfectly honest. Looking at the label, it's technically in between the two. It's 14%, um, which is, yeah, it's about, it's about right uh, for the region. But um, one of the few instances you can compare whites and reds on the same level. Okay, um, let's talk about um, fruits here, because I know we didn't, we didn't get to, we, we thought it was more of an other wine, but we didn't actually talk about the fruits. So are these black? Are they red? Is it blue? Is it multiple? So let's start there. Yeah, like black, maybe some red. No, black I don't taste any blue. Yeah, not blue. <laughs> not, not blue. Not blue. That's, that's a big hint too. Like that's, that's all evidence, so not blue. <laughs> Anyone that disagrees with that, that it's only black or only red? And I, can only, I can only see some of you at the same time. So uh, yeah, I think this is a mix of black and red. Um, let's talk about now the types of fruits. Are these like sour? Are they tart? Are they underripe? Or is it like ripe and baked or raisinated? Like where do we fall on that spectrum? Yeah, we think like sour tart. Sour tart? I believe. Yeah. yeah tart cherries. We all feel good about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think sour is is spot on here. Like sour red fruit. And that's you know, that's a huge clue for this group. Not too many um, um I should say it kind of takes us out of the you know riper warmer climates. It's really hard to get sour fruit unless you're doing it intentionally um, in a warmer, sunnier climate. You know, this is not generally something you would find in, say, like again, California or Washington or something like that, um, or even warmer parts of uh, Europe, like say southern France. Like it gets pretty darn hot there. So. With that being said, we've got all of our evidence. We've got fruit, we've got flowers, we've got herbs. We know that it doesn't have any new oak on it, at least. Does anyone want to throw out a guess? It's our last wine, so everyone. There's no wrong answers. Well, there are. <laughs> it's okay. I learn the most when I call things wrong or I make mistakes. And it sounds cliche, but it's. 100% true. You learn nothing when almost nothing when you get it right. Sometimes it's even just being like, what country do I think this is from? What country does this taste like? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good place to start. Let's throw it. I would out. guess France. Oh, good. So you're, you're in the old world. So we, th we thought Spain or Italy. Spain or Italy? France, Spain, Italy. Okay, great. Those are three good classics right there. Yeah. Now, France, Spain, and Italy, let's throw out a few grapes. <laughs> what, let's start with, uh, let's start with France. What are some grapes in France? 
Well, I think that Pinot Noir is a grape that's red fruited. It can be drying. It can be a little bit more earthy in France. Mm -hmm. I think from Spain, we could throw in like Tempranillo because mm -hmm. I think it's also red fruited, has some black fruit. Sour. Sour, earthy. Mm -hmm. So that fits the bill. What about Italy? I feel like I feel like you guys know and yeah, no. good. Yeah, no, like uh, you know, Sangiovese and Brunello and Barolo and like all the Chianti ones. Okay. So uh, with Sangiovese, Brunello and Chianti, so the, all of those are Sangiovese and then Barolo is the great Nebbiolo. So those are really great guesses. So again, you have sour fruit, you have elevated acid, elevated tannin, mostly red, and a lot of sort of this like herbaceous, earthy quality. So all four of those grapes are honestly where most sommeliers take a wine like this. Sure. It becomes the grouping of wines that you then try to deduce out of. So really good job, you guys. <laughs> yeah, so, and as, as you get more practice, the evidence that you know we've compiled or tasted or noted will help us eliminate other things. So we'll start with the one I said, and Tempranillo. So Tempranillo from Northern Central Spain, traditionally, again, not always, but traditionally was aged <coughs> with American oak. It's aged in, you know, American oak is a very flavor imparting um, aging vessel and gives you flavors like, you know, coconut and dill um, at times, lots of vanilla and, you know, really has uh, either in Tempranillo or in American Cabernet gives a lot of flavors that we didn't really talk about here. So we'll, we'll kick Tempranillo out. Now we're down to three grapes. We can look at Pinot Noir from Burgundy, which Cara mentioned. And the way we can kind of look at that one is, <clears throat> again, we didn't note any um, Pinot Noir and Burgundy, um, particularly as you, as you climb the, the quality levels, um, is aged in new French oak and <clears throat> also has some winemaking techniques that we're not really seeing here, like stem inclusion, which gives you some exotic spice and different tannins. Um, Pinot Noir is typically a softer a great variety in terms of the bitterness as well and just kind of you know more fragrant and pretty um, overall than I think this wine lets on to be. Um, so for multiple reasons we're going to kick Pinot Noir. And now we're left with Sangiovese in Nebbiolo and congratulations you are now trying to decide between two grapes that has have decided the fate for many um, current master sommeliers and many that are um, still not because this is a grape. These are two grapes that have so much in common that it, it I don't know too many people that are very, very, very skilled at separ separating the two, uh, myself included, um, but everyone over time comes up with their own tricks uh, to separate the two. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I will say that probably the most successful one um, I've heard and have, um, have practiced is that Nebbiolo typically has very like pretty dried fruit, is mostly red fruit, whereas Sangiovese can, depending on the quality level, if it's Chianti or Chianti Classico or Brunello, um, is for sure red fruited, but can also have black fruit. But it also gets sour, and that's what this wine is. It's sour, and that's exactly what we have is Sangiovese. So, one of my favorite producers in Chianti, um, Isole Eolena, 2016. And you know, this is fairly, I mean, this is fairly young for them. Um, you can easily find examples from them that will age for decades. Even their like basic wines are delicious for, for the long haul. Um, but definitely a, uh, uh, another one of, you know, we have Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and Saint-Gervais, all wines that are on many wine lists if you go out even to uh, a very, um, even to a, a casual, 
uh, even a casual restaurant, um, but you can also find them on, you know, many store shelves. And that was the idea behind choosing these three wines is that um, not only wanted to try and give you some insight into the blind tasting aspect of it, but insight into, um, you know, why the flavors uh, taste the way they do and how you can recognize them and you know, maybe even use them at home. And one thing, so you'll see we've noted um, <clears throat> uh, on the visuals, ruby with some garnet, that bolded under fruit is tart red fruit, sour cherry. Like that's, that's pretty consistent for most Sangiovese, even like grown in Napa, you can still taste that element of it. Um, certainly the herbal green component, someone said fennel earlier, very nice, uh, roasted savory herbs. Um, and another piece that I had uh, bolded here was the vinegar under other. And I don't want that to sound off-putting, but think about like a red wine vinegar or balsamic vinegar where it has flavor, but it's still sharp. And that's something you would use as like a dressing over salad um, or over meats for marinade. Like that's what Sangiovese um, kind of gives me that maybe Nebbiolo does not is that kind of vinegar aspect. And, um, you know, if you think about the types of food you're having in Tuscany, when you've got all these beautiful tomatoes in season and these, you know, red, um, uh, red pasta sauces and things like that. Like you want a wine like this to, you know, have tomato acid and acid and wine to kind of complement one another. And, you know, before you, the bottle is gone and all the pasta is, is gone. So um, it makes sense that you would do that. So I know we could never, never cover everything in that amount of time that, um, you know, I would, would like to, but I'm uh, happy to be a resource. Does anyone have uh, questions right now? You can put them in the chat. You can unmute yourself. Like, yeah, by any means. yeah, we've got a, we've got a question um, about Chianti and Sangiovese. So, so Chianti, uh, Chianti is a blend, right? It's got some Sangiovese and then some other grapes. So, um, by law, a Chianti has to be a minimum amount of Sangiovese. They have the um, ability or the permission from the government there, the consortio, to blend in other grapes. Um, for a long time, they mandated certain white grapes had to be blended in a Chianti, and it took them a while to, to um, remove that requirement from it. And Isole Eolena, the Sangiovese here, was a big proponent of that. They were a big reason for Chianti, you know, kind of getting rid of their old rigid ways that, you know, were irrelevant. Um, but yes, as you go from Chianti to Chianti Classico, and then if they have a subregion on the, the label like Rufina, <clears throat> um, and then getting to Brunello, which is 100% Sangiovese, um, the, there's an increasing requirement for more Sangiovese. Uh, but you might see other grapes like uh, Caneolo or Colorina that can certainly give more color as well as a slightly different uh, fruit profile. But in terms of the more prominent producers, most are, you know, they're mostly Sangiovese with just a touch of other grapes, if any. And, then and so do you, do you use like Chianti and Sangiovese kind of interchangeably, I guess? Like um... if you're talking about like a wine that does come from that the village or the area in Tuscany called Chianti, then absolutely. But you know when you say Chianti that you mean Sangiovese. You just say similar like with Brunello. Brunello is Sangiovese as well, but it's typically 100% Sangiovese and it tends to be aged longer and um, yeah. it's a different clone that tends just to be a little fuller body. So you usually see Brunello de Montalcino or Rosso di Montalcino, which is Sangiovese from the village of Montalcino, also in Tuscany. Those ones tend to be so very expensive. Um, whereas Chianti, Chianti Classico, those ones can be a little bit more affordable and more just like bistro friendly or tutoria friendly. Very serious versions of them exist, but they're definitely food friendly ones. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I know it's like difficult when you walk through the you know the the aisle at the grocery store and there's like eight or ten different Chiantis and it's like well how do you how do you choose and um yeah it's 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 not easy but you know i think the 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 nice thing or the dependable thing is that 
know, these regions and these governments were created so that they wouldn't be imitated. So that if you go to the store and buy a bottle of Chianti or Brunello or Sancerre, that they've met a minimum level of requirements for where the grapes come from, how they're treated, how they're aged, um, how they're released to the market, so that you at least get a semblance of what that wine should taste like and where it comes from. Um, because especially before all of this, all of these um, regions and consortios and governments were created, you had a lot of um, imitation wines out there. And California is a perfect example of that for, you know, Carlo Rossi Burgundy and, um, you know, Corbel Champagne and things like that, so. For sure. So, what, one other question I had was with, uh, with blends in general, um, almost every wine is some form of blend, right? So how, how do you typically go about defining a wine being like this, for example, being San Giovese, it says Chianti Classico on the, on the label. Um, so what, how do, how does, is there any laws around that or is it specific to the region or, or how does that sort of work? Because I know, I, like there, there are rules around that around watches and around other kinds of, you know, specific labeling kinds of things. So I'm wondering if it varies grape to grape or, or, in, and so separate to that is how about when you're tasting, right? Like if you're trying to define what grape is in it, um, is that sort of, you, you talk about the blends in there or do you talk about like the main grape? That those those kinds of questions like that I've had for a while. In terms of um, in terms of blinding or you know for exams that you know I've been through, um, there's not a whole lot of. Um, thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks for joining. The so in terms of blends for the exam, there's not a whole lot of places that are blending classically. I mean, there's Bordeaux. You might get a little bit in Napa, um, southern, southern France and the Rhone Valley. But for the most part, most of the regions and wines, you know, we're tested on and are tasting, in terms of blind tasting, um, focus primarily on one grape variety. With others as sort of a complementary or, or a, sub, uh, a subset to add a little bit to the wine. Um, and the second part of your question, yes, you're absolutely right. The Chianti Classico. I want to say it's 75% minimum Sangiovese. Um, and then they will also set maximums sometimes. Like you can't have more than 10% uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which I think is allowed in Chianti Classico. Um, but they don't want that to become the focus of Chianti Classico. So you can use it to kind of build some body and some color, but you can't have it be more than 10% of the wine because it's a very, um, uh, it's a very like stern, distinct grape variety. This particular one um, is 80% Sangiovese, 15% Caniolo, which is a classic Tuscan blending grape, and 5% Syrah. Syrah, ah, interesting. Yeah, just a tiny bit, and it's aged in huge barrels um, that are about 4,000 liter wooden casks where it matures. And this, um, you know, I was, I noticed it earlier while we were. <clears throat> going through the site, but this, you know, it has, for Chianti Classico, it has a fair amount of color concentration. It's not uncommon to have like a very light, like pale, um, like a very, a very pale kind of ruby or garnet color um, for wines of this age or even younger. But I think that little bit of Syrah and that, that good dose of Canaiolo, like it, it gives it more color than Sangiovese might otherwise. Um, mm -hmm give or lend itself to the wine. Very cool. Um, the Chardonnay that we enjoyed from Russian River Valley in Sonoma, of course, that's 100%. That was um, whole cluster press, which we talk about all native yeast, which all of these wines see. And it does see full native malolactic fermentation, which takes place in the barrel. That's where you're getting sort of this natural creaminess that sort of comes out of it. And um, we say surly batonnage, which is when it is in the barrel with all of its dead yeast and batonnage means they're stirring it. And that also adds to like a creamy quality because the, the juice and the, and the yeast is sort of moving together. And that's where you can kind of get those like almond, marzipan, toasty qualities. Um, it was aged for one year in 
um, French oak barrels, 25% of that was new. So it's not a heavily new French oak wine, but you can definitely feel the influence. A little bit of oak goes a long way. Um, and then the Sancerre was 100% Sauvignon Blanc that was completely fermented and aged in stainless steel. So it's all about the pureness of the fruit. You can read a little bit more information. I sent you guys the links. Yeah, and um, I know, I mean, I, like Kara said, you know, tasted for years and I, you know, I remember even like working in tasting rooms and knowing I wanted to take the exam and just getting started with blind tasting. It's a very gradual process. And that's why the, um, the first two exams, the, the tasting is written. It's not with someone in front of you, like listening to everything you say. It's a very small set of possible wines and it's all written and, you know, a lot of time is given to complete those wines. And um, that's because it, it takes a long time to develop that, to develop a skill because it is a skill. It's not a natural ability. I think um, generally people that are really, really good tasters, it's because they're, um, you know, it's more of a personality thing and less about their actual ability to taste. It's, they can listen to themselves very well. I think of like a Rebecca Feynman or a Jason Heller, like just, or Allegra Angela, who you know, yeah. unfortunately still hasn't passed, but like way better taster than I am. Like they, they just listen to themselves and like, well, this is the evidence. That's literally all it could be. Um, they don't get wrapped up in, well, I tasted one thing that kind of reminds me of another grape. They're like, no, 99% of the evidence I just gave is for this wine. So that's what it is. And, you know, it reminds me of um, like very good lawyers. Like they can just, you know, they put a whole argument together and um, they can, they can nail it. But uh, uh, my point is it, it takes, it takes a long time. And, you know, what I hope we at least provided uh, other than some insight into, into what it takes is just kind of dispelling some of the myths and, and the, I wouldn't say elitism, but just like, you know, wine is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be shared. And um, yeah, we, we blind things for fun, but it's more about um, having a conversation and, and getting together and not, don't be afraid to be wrong or to take a guess because that's, that's how you learn. Can tell you how many wines I've gotten wrong in order to get enough right to pass. Um, and that's, you know, that's all a part of the journey. Um, Some of the best blind tasters I know are just our wine lovers. They're yeah. lectures or they're wine lovers. They get around bottles with their friends and they just taste and taste and taste. They watch some videos on YouTube about using the correct language and things like that. And it's just about learning to find what you love and how to talk about what you love. How to, uh, how to you know, enunciate what you're looking for. It looks, it looks like a magic trick. But really, it's just once, like you, like Kara said, when you learn the language, and then also like how to tie that back to certain places. That's that's literally all it is. You know, like well, um, like on the Sangiovese. Okay, well, has garnet color. The intensity of the nose is medium plus. The fruit condition, it's red fruited mostly, and it's you know sour and tart. And there's a lot of herbaceous, earthy things that stick out to me. Like if I said that to Kara right now without her knowing the wine you would, I have full confidence she would be, have narrowed it down to three grapes or less already, and she hasn't even tasted the wine. Yeah. And it's an interesting exercise we used to do with friends that one person describes the wine they're tasting, the other person just listens, and oftentimes the person listening gets it right more than the person tasting, mm -hmm. because the person tasting lays out everything that that wine is, but then listens to some other emotion in their head and goes a complete different direction. Whereas uh, Vince, how, how, like, uh, you know, on that point, like how, when you smell a wine, how close do you get just smelling the wine, not even tasting it? Like, do you, do you typically like smell the wine and go like, that's definitely a sense of face to say, and then you, and then you have a taste and you're like, yup, it is. Or like, um, how much of your final like decision as to what it is based on just the nose as opposed to the, to the palate? Uh, it depends on the grape. I mean, uh, Cara can tell you probably something like this. You're like, okay, Sauvignon Blanc, I just need to figure out where it's from. And I've only smelled it. So then 
you kind of save yourself some time and you're like, all right, I need to taste this and decide, you know, what is the acidity? Is there any oak on it? And what is the fruit condition? Because those are all things that are going to help me decide whether it's from the Loire Valley in France, from Bordeaux in France, from Napa in California, or from Marlboro in New Zealand, because each of them has their own little quirks and details. And it's, it's less about figuring out what it is, and it's more about, okay, I know the grape, but which, which place is it? Pinot Noir is the same thing, because you could get tested on California, Oregon, France, or Otago, and on the South Island in New Zealand, um, or Cabernet, God, there's so many countries you could be tested on, and it's really just, um, uh, it's, it's doing that type of work. Whereas like, Syrah from Northern Rhone, like cut roti, that's one of those where you pick it up, you're like, oh, thank you. Like, let me just, you know, blow this wine out of the water and save some time, you know, finish it in three minutes and give myself extra time to work on the wines that don't come to me right away. That you have to put a lot of, you know, investigative work into during that four minute period. Um, so yeah, yes and no, there's some that, you can recognize kind of right away. And there's others where you recognize a compound in it, like pyrazines, which we discussed, doesn't necessarily help you get the exact rate, but it helps you narrow things down. Um, that, uh, like the Sangiovese is another good example where it's not uncommon in Italian wine and you know in other parts of the world to, to get that vinegar type of flavor, and we call it volatile acidity. And that's a byproduct of uh, generally in winemaking of wine interacting with oxygen and then converting to vinegar. If you leave a glass of wine on your counter for two hours, three hours, and you come back to it, you'll notice like some of it's evaporated and there's a rim around it, but then it also kind of smells like, like weird. It smells like vinegar almost. And that's that process already happening. Well, sometimes that happens during the winemaking process too, for a number of different reasons. And, you know, in Sangiovese, in Nebbiolo, in Corvina, which is in Amarone, in Northeastern Italy, you may get some in, you know, in Napa or other wines that have lots of ripeness, but it's a, it's a, it's a flavor that doesn't necessarily help you get the grape, but it helps you get to a group of potential um, possibilities. So it kind of, there's a number of, of different things that you can take that, take that question or that initial smell. Yeah. I'm gonna um, send you guys a few little things right now. One is going to be just a little list of like classic wines, regions, and grapes that we, that we made. Um, so if you kind of want to play around, it's sort of a list of like, all right, these are really, really great, uh, a great place to start. And I'll also give you um, a grid, a tasting grid that we made that uses more of the sommelier language. I use it oftentimes well, when the bar was open, when sommeliers would want to come in and blind. Um, and I think I can share a file in here. And while Cara's doing that, I'll mention that you know, um, the exam focuses on a, a specific set of wines. So, you know, it's in this case, like Sangiovese from Tuscany. You're not gonna taste Sangiovese from Lodi. Like it, you know, you're not gonna get blinded on that sort of thing. So there is, there is rhyme and reason to the exam itself. So you do have at least somewhat of a blueprint um, to follow in terms of the wines you should be looking at. Um, you know, not Tempranillo from Texas or Oregon or things like that. It's going to come from Spain. So, you know, there, there's that. There is certainly a, um, a, at least a loose understanding of the types of wines that you could be uh, examined on. And, you know, I think the, the value or the strength in that is that when you understand the classics and where they came from, then you have context for when someone is growing Sangiovese or Tempranillo in Southern Oregon or in Lodi and you say, okay, I'm comparing this to where it comes from, but it has its own unique take on it and, you know, decide if I like it instead of you going to taste that Sangiovese in Lodi and saying, oh, well, this is what all Sangiovese tastes like. It's like, well, no, not really. So, 
you know, what I appreciate most about the process is it's given me a base or a context for understanding the, the rest of the world of wine and natural wine and things like that. I don't know, all sorts of different categories. Yeah. And that goes back to how, you know, decant um, picks our wines. We look for typicity. That goes back to how master sommelier or wine directors pick wines for their restaurants and lists um, because it's about really understanding sort of the classics and then being able to understand sort of the influences beyond that. It's sort of like, um, uh, it's sort of like if you've never read anything from Mark Twain and you've only read Kerouac, like there's sort of, there's a difference. You have to sort of understand the foundation of like great American literature before you, you know, so you can truly understand where the next part of great American literature came from. It's kind of a, a thing I, I often use. Yeah. Or like, or like music or any other type yeah. of trade. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy those things, like just jumping into it and reading or listening, like you can enjoy it, but you know, understanding where it came from, it's, it's just a different type of enjoyment and it's not for everyone. Thing I say it's a, most to, to everybody that asks is look just taste a wine decide if you like it or not like don't like beat yourself over the head if you don't like the wine and say well if i knew more about it i'd like it like no you like it or you don't but ask yourself the question why like okay i don't like it but why oh i like it but why oh it has this fruit or i don't like it because it i don't know if that's the acid but it's tart and it's sour and i don't really like that okay, well, that, that helps steer you in a direction. But if you just say, oh, well, I like it and leave it at that, well, you may not be able to verbalize that later or find other things that you like um, or find the reason that you like it. So as long as, you know, you enjoy it, then that's, that's all that matters to me as a sommelier. And I hope anyone that takes care of you, any restaurants that you visit, and I know Cara and Simi are very much the same. Like, we just want people to be happy whether it's you know water or wine or whatever and um, hopefully today gave you at least some of the tools to just really describe what you're tasting and also um, beat your friends when you're at a house party <laughs> with blind tasting so there you go. I just sent you um, my grid that I built that was basically sort of what I use for a more advanced level of wine tasting Feel free to print it out, play with it, go through it, see if you can figure it out. If you have any questions on it, you need any definitions, you let me know, or you can even Google it to understand because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of information out there. Yeah, and I mean it would it would take us many many classes and many many hours and looking at a lot of different wines to build more context. <laughs> and hopefully we'll maybe we can do that while I'm in Germany, uh, but if not, we'll definitely hit that when when I get back. 10,000 hours. I also sent you guys a, um, a link to Vince when he was featured on Vice News last year. So there's a little bit of him blind tasting as well um, here in San Francisco. So take a, take a little look at that too. And, and, uh, and him lifting weights too. I, I saw. Yeah, he's, he's, lifting and lifting. <laughs> he's, a, yeah. he's like blinding like on a surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> next that's the next we're gonna like stand up paddleboard in a canoe or something and taste in the ocean or um, I don't know that was a funny <clears throat> um, a, a good friend of mine who unfortunately hasn't um, passed yet because of tasting he had um, he had to take theory again because he reset so you get you, if you pass theory you get three tries at service and tasting he unfortunately did not pass tasting after three tries so we had to start over at theory and in order to get ready again, he had started, um, uh, he worked out with a mutual friend who's an ex-Marine who owns a, uh, is a trainer and owns a gym, but also works as a wine director. So he'd bring him into the gym for private lessons and he'd just ask him, ask him questions off of flashcards while he was working out. And it gave me the idea that, yeah, under duress, you can't really focus or think, kind of like a Marine marine or like boot camp or basic training like you you have to be able to maintain composure even though you're physically uncomfortable mm -hmm. so we we i had the idea and i couldn't think of a better person to do it uh, justin um to like hey like can you put it put together a workout but also pick six like really good classic fair wines to blind me on like, i didn't know anybody else 
in my immediate circle that could understand both of those things at the same time. And so that's where the idea came up. And yeah. I didn't do it for 2019 when I passed. I'll just put it that way. But it was a good exercise, literally and figuratively. Amazing, you guys. Everybody, thank you so much. I hope this was informative. Now we have a little bit of a base, uh, a foundation for everyone so we can continue your, uh, your tasting skills. And then I will also put this up. Um, I'll send you guys a WeTransfer link to the video probably tomorrow once it converts too, so you can look back on it if you need. Mm -hmm. and awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank really appreciate you. it, Vince and Cara. Thank you. Oh, Vince. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye.